This morning we're going to pick up our study in Ezra chapter 9. Last week we really looked at the, the situation around uh, the intermarriage of the returned exiles with uh, their neighbors, the heathen neighbors, and we looked at the Old Testament and New Testament really issues uh, around that, that issue, that problem. And we're going to pick up in verse 3 of chapter 9, New International Version, of course, where after Ezra heard this, verse 3 of chapter 9, when I heard this, I tore my tunic and cloak, pulled hair from my head and beard, and sat down appalled. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel gathered around me because of this unfaithfulness of the exiles, and I sat there appalled until the evening sacrifice. Now, verse 3 gives to us what we would today call Ezra's meltdown at the news that the children of Israel had gone back and really gone back to the same sins that brought them into captivity to begin with. And Ezra, in effect, stripped himself naked when he tore his tunic. His tunic was his undergarment as well as his cloak. So he virtually stripped himself naked and what he had done, pulled his hair out of his beard, pulled his hair out of his, off his head, uh, and became almost paralyzed because he sat down appalled uh, at what the news was. And the passage says that he sat there in self-abasement. That word is our word for, is the word for fasting. So he, he not only did all of this to himself, and, and evidently this happened earlier in the day when he got this news that he then fasted for the rest of the afternoon or until the evening. Now, there's a couple of questions that come up out of, out of his reaction, his response to sin. Now, how far should we react to viewing evil? Or to put it in a different way, if we don't act like Ezra, does that mean that we're not troubled at sin? Was his actions a model, an example for how we should respond to sin? Definitely not. Definitely not. Yeah, and I think all of those, all those responses or answers to that response to sin is correct. And, and I think it's interesting uh, to think about his, his response. Ezra's deep anguish was acted out emotionally according to the customs of his world. Uh, the the cultures of the Middle East are very demonstrative just by their culture. And he acted out in accordance to what was the norm, the culture of that world, of the people of Israel. Very demonstrative. 
But do we have to be demonstrative to have true anguish at sin? In other words, do we have to blow up an abortion clinic to prove that we don't approve of abortion? Do we have to um, drive down the road waving a rebel flag to prove that we don't like what our country's doing? Do we have to uh, get into physical violent demonstrations and conflicts to prove we're upset? Do we have to do that? Okay. Why not? Huh? Vengeance is the I still couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. Vengeance is the Lord's. Vengeance is the Lord's. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, in thinking about this, sometimes we feel like that if somebody does something, you have an issue that comes up within your family, something comes up within the church. You know, how should we respond? This was something that came up within the community of Israel. And Ezra just lost it. Does that mean that if we don't show some kind of physical actions that we really are not disturbed at sin? No, I don't think so. Once again, it was the culture. And we can allow grief. And what we should do is to allow grief to fill our hearts to dictate the emotional, physical response to the offense to God. I think that's some of the problems sometimes that people have in reacting to things that they don't like. They don't like it. Really, whether it offends God or not might not be the big issue. I don't like it, and I'm going to do something about it. And we begin to act like a nut. Or we begin to do things that have more repercussions down the line that instead of solving something, we create bigger issues even down the road. And so I, I think it's just, you know, the model we should see in what Ezra does here is that sin is terrible within the camp. Whether it's in the camp of our family, whether it's in the camp of our own lives, whether it's in the camp of the church, whatever it might be, sin is a terrible thing, and there should be anguish. But I don't think we need to automatically think we've got to do something radical to show we are upset. Uh, I, I think we should be very careful about that. Should can we demonstrate? Yeah. Do we need to demonstrate with clubs and rocks and Molotov cocktails and things like that? No, not, no, that's, we're not projecting the message of Christ. We're projecting more our disappointment rather than maybe God's disappointment in something. Well, I think Ezra here, let's look at his audience. Mm -hmm. He had the people that said those that uh, prevalent the word of God, those were around. Yeah. point with that because yeah because his response to sin was a, in a large measure due to his position and 
he was the assigned teacher. The king had assigned him. He had spent his life researching and looking into the word of God, the, the law of Moses. He was a learned scribe. He had all of this. And to think, for one thing, he had been there four months and it, he had missed it. It was the lower level leaders, if you will, that came to him and said, listen, the people in the land have done something terrible here. And that's how he learned of it. And he probably felt a personal sense of failure here. Because of his position, of who he was. And he had been sent, teach the people the laws of your God, administer justice, do all of these things. He's been there for four months, and yet he's been doing a lot of things, but he missed until they came and told him. He had missed this was going on. And so I'm sure he felt a personal degree of failure here. Not that he was guilty of anything, but he felt that he himself, in his position, had missed something, and he needed, due to his position, due, due to his role, all of these things, he had to make the point, this cannot go on in the nation. Now, would it be advantageous for leaders in our nation, leaders in our denomination, let's enlarge it out, to maybe act a little more like this over sin? And people, as we talked last week, people will never go beyond their leader. If their leader sets an expectation that these things are okay, very few people will ever step and go above that and say, no, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live more differently. I know that's not proper grammar, but more differently than what they're saying. People just don't go. You see it in your work. They won't go above what their supervisor thinks they ought to do. If the supervisor's happy, I'm good. a lot of weight. Yeah. We don't have that right now. And it seems like more and more of the people we would think would be the leadership examples are showing less than good leadership in this. And they're beginning to cave. They're beginning to adjust what has been the biblical message. So, I, I, you know, Ezra saw himself in his response to it, his initial response. Indeed, he was a man of God. He was upset. But due to his position, he had to let the people who trembled at the word of God and let this nation know that this cannot go on. And as the leader, I'm going to let you know that this is an offense to God. It's not just an offense to me as an individual. That's never the important thing. You know, how many times have you ever heard somebody say something, well, pardon my French, but as if, I'm sorry I made you, a, I might make you upset by what I say. That's not the issue at all. The issue is, does it make God upset? You know, you need to tell him part of my French. Really? <laughs> you know. Um.
And we need our, our response to sin should not just be guided by, but it should be something that our culture and our society understands that they, we are upset at what has happened in offense to God, not just to us, because that's where you get into tradition and you know we had never done it this way, so I, you, know, you ain't going to do it this way either. But what does that matter to God? Yeah. And is God offended by what we are doing or not doing? Whatever that matter is. And our response, and you said some, some leaders in churches are going through some deep heart anguish. There's where, you know, that's what the example of Ezra leads us to. Now, how that is then exposed, it may be denominational splits. It may be church splits. It may be even family that you lose the uh, you know splits in family Jesus himself said that children will be against their parents and parents against their children over me and those are heart wrenching decisions when a parent or child has to make that either stand against their parent or the parent against the child whatever the case may be they get away from the book. The men in this church has literally got away from God and church of God. Oh, yeah, as, as have a number of churches. And yes. I'm afraid a lot yes. of Baptist yes. churches are headed that way. What's going on in life for no reason similar. Not pleasant. I mean, it's unbelievable. Some of the decisions they're making. And that, I couldn't do it. No. I'd have to leave. I'd have to leave, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would too. And, and I think it, when we think about the response to sin, no, we don't have to act like everybody else. People do act different. That's important. And understand that in a position with a role, sometimes you have to make sure that people understand this is not something that can go on, continue to go on, either in our family or in our church. And if our position allows us in our community. I mean, you know. And... Make sure that it centers around here. Not that I'm hacked off, but this is something that, according to the book, God is upset with. And that, you know, that becomes the balance to keep our emotions in line rather than saying, you know, well, I just don't like this, so I'm going to boom, boom, whatever it might be. No, what, what, where, where, what, who are we trying to justify? Who are we trying to take into consideration is it God or is it us I remember hearing of a family and one of the daughters had gotten divorced and, and this was a very conservative family and they were just devastated that she'd gotten divorced wasn't her fault but they were just devastated and when they found out that she was going to be engaged to a man who had been divorced. From my understanding, it blew the roof off the house virtually. 
I mean, you would have thought Moses had come down from the mountain and saw what he saw. You know, that was, it was, it was, it, yeah. Who was being, up? what was the issue? It was that family's issue. They didn't like it. Or was it me that was upset? And am I responding because I don't like it? Or am I responding because I know this is an offense to God? You know, it's something that we need to think about as we have our response to the growing pressure on us as believers to see what is our proper response. How do we project? the proper response that glorifies God in it and keeps our carnality out of it. It's a challenge. I mean, it's, it's, it's not easy. You know, uh, when, I, when I facilitated family meetings and I trained that for uh, social workers, I would tell them that, you know, your role as a facilitator in that meeting, you are neutral. You have no side. You have no vote. And I said, do we have an opinion? Yeah. I said, there was a number of means. I just soon take them out back and shoot them. That would have solved the caseload problem right there. But I couldn't let that show as I facilitated. I mean, I had to be just as respectful to that person that I just as soon take out back and shoot as I was to the worker that was trying to rectify the situation. That's a challenge <laughs> at times. Um, but we have to think, you know, what are we upset about? Who are we upset about? I think that's important as we look about at Ezra's response. But after Ezra made his demonstration, it says, then, verse 5, at the evening sacrifice. So like I said, it evidently must have happened earlier in the day. At the time of the evening sacrifice, I rose from my self-abasement, his fasting, with my tunic and cloak torn, and fell on my knees with my hands spread out to the Lord my God and prayed. Oh, my God, I am too ashamed and disgraced to lift up my face to you, my God, because our sins are higher than our heads and our guilt has reached to the heavens. From the days of our forefathers until now, our guilt has been great because of our sins we and our kings and our priests have been subjected to the sword in captivity, to pillage and humiliation at the hand of foreign kings as it is today. But now for a brief moment, the Lord our God has been gracious in leaving us a remnant and giving us a firm place in his sanctuary. And so our God gives light to our eyes and a little relief in our bondage. Though we are slaves, our God has not deserted us in our bondage. He has shown us kindness in the sight of the kings of Persia. He has granted us new life to rebuild the house of our God and repair its ruins. And he has given us a wall of protection in Judah and Jerusalem. But now, oh our God, what can we say after this? For we have disregarded the commands you gave through your service, the prophets, when you said the land you are entering to possess is a land polluted by the corruption of its peoples. By their detestable practices, you have filled it with their, with their impurity from one end to the other. Therefore, do not give your daughters in marriage to take their sons or take their daughters to your, for your sons. Do not seek a treaty or friendship with them at any time that you may be strong and eat the good things of the land and Leave it to your children as an everlasting inheritance. What has happened to us is a result of our evil deeds and our great guilt. And yet, our God, you have punished us less than our sins have deserved and have given us a remnant like this. Shall we again break your commands and intermarry with the peoples who commit such detestable practices. Would you not be angry enough with us to destroy us, leaving us no remnant or survival? Oh, Lord our God, you are righteous. We are left this day as a remnant.
Here we are before you in our guilt, though because of it, not one of us can stand in your presence. I mean, that's powerful. <laughs> that's powerful as you read that. But let's look at his prayer. If Ezra started off by saying, I am too ashamed and disgraced to lift up my face to you. And we've already touched on this a little bit. You know, he could have said, look what they have done. But he included himself in this. Maybe he was feeling some personal guilt for having missed it for the four months that he was there. I don't, I don't know. But he would not exempt himself. He, he, he put himself in the lot. We, we, I, have failed. And he confessed his sin. He said, you know, and what is significant about Ezra's confession is that he linked the present sin of Israel with the historic pattern of Israel's failure. The returned exile sin was nothing new. Remember, he goes, he, in the prayer, he said, you told Moses when you brought us into the land, don't get mixed up with these peoples because of their detestable practices. It wasn't because of the peoples, it was because of the practices. And he said, don't, don't get involved with them because they will pollute you, basically. So it was old sin renewed, if you will. And I, I, I think it's, you know, a message to us is when we fail, we see failure in our lives, think about it. It's really nothing new. It's our old carnal nature. It's old sins that have come back. And we've been seduced by the same failures that we had years ago. Ezra offered his confession of sin. And then he noted the just reward for Israel's historic sins were, as prophesied from Moses down through Zechariah into Malachi, right, you know, right on down the line. The nation had and was still under the foot of Gentile power. And up until probably 1948, Israel remained under the foot of Gentile power. And even after 48, I'd say probably within the last 10, 20 years, as Israel actually begun to not necessarily need the support of nations like America to be able to survive. They still depend on us, you know, don't get me wrong. But you're thinking 2,500 years, they have been under the foot and until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, which will end up being in the tribulation period, they will really still remain under the control and influence and or domination of Gentile powers. In verses 8 through 10, Ezra in his prayer noted the continued goodness of God. That even with their great past sinfulness, God has been gracious. He has shown us kindness in the sight of the kings of Persia, granted us new life to rebuild the house of God. He's given us a wall of protection. And this is basically a summary of the 80 years that had transpired from the time the, the, the children of Israel were allowed to come back in 538 to that present moment. About 80 years had taken place. And he said, you know, God has been good to us. And even during the captivity, God had been good to them. And it's, it's a wonderful consolation to know that even when we fail, God's goodness is still constant toward us. God, Israel, even though he calls them to be taken into terrible captivity, he was still good to them. No other people have endured what Israel has endured, what the Jews have endured, and still are recognized. He's still being good to them, you know? 
And when we fail, whether it's individually or when we see it happen in our church, happen in our families, whatever, don't forget, God's still there. If you are his child, and that's where the if comes in, if you are his child, he's not going to leave you alone. He's going to still be good to you. He's going to let consequences happen to our failures and our sins. He, you know, you want to be stupid, he'll let you be stupid, you know. But he'll still be there for you. His grace and mercy is still there. I've said it many times in the class that I sat in the, in the independent Baptist church and sat there one Sunday and said, take your best shot. I don't care. I'd advise you, don't tell God that. He can really take some good shots, you know. <laughs> uh, I won't tell him that again. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> but he was there. I can look back and see just how good he was. How much I deserved, as Ezra said, you've done, you have given us less than our sins deserved. And I can see it in my own life and my failures. You may be able to see it in yours if you've had instances of great failure in your life. Just how good God has been in, in spite of what we've done. So there, there was an encouragement there for each of us. But then Ezra confessed, you know, we have disregarded the commands all over again. And, you know, he said, we're going down the same path that we traveled before that led to our destruction. It kind of reminds us what the writer to the Hebrews said in chapter 10, that failure and turning away from the Lord is to trample the Son of God underfoot and to treat as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant and insulted the spirit of grace. That's what we do when we fail. That's what we're doing. And that's why it's just wonderful to know that God's still merciful to us and doesn't give us all that we deserve. But he ends up with this question. And I think this is a powerful, powerful verse. He says in verse 14, shall, and I think this ought to be like a plaque in our, in our homes. Shall we again break your commands? and intermarry with the peoples who commit such detestable practices, would you not be angry enough with us to destroy us, leaving us no remnant or survivor? The question that Ezra made at this point, and we should ask our own, our, ourselves, how much does God have to allow the consequences and punishments and judgments to engulf us before we get to point? What does God have to do for you to get to point, for me to get to point? I, I think that's a good question to ask us. Some people, never get it. Some people never get it. And that's unfortunate. And I think that's as much an indication not that they've backslid, but maybe they don't have anything. Maybe they never got it to begin with. Or if they, they truly were saved, they are living their life, losing the, the goodness of the rewards that God has, and at the same time open themselves up to God's punishment. Trying to get us to see how much more have I got to do to you before you get to point and stop doing what you're doing? It's kind of like this. How hard is it for you to stay on a diet? How many of us have started a diet and never finished it? We finished it all right, you know. Like I finished off five donuts this weekend. Yeah. Health food, no calories at all in those. Um, how hard is it to stay on a diet? You know, what do we have to do 
to realize you can't, you can't live like that every day, you know. Uh, what do we have to do? What has to happen for us to give up some habits that we have? What has to happen for us to get the point? It's kind of like one of, the, one of the coordinators told me with the heart transplant, right after the heart transplant, she said, Billy said, this heart should last you 20, 30 years. Now you can kill it like you did the other one. <laughs> yeah. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Happy Valentine's, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it kind of caught me off guard. You know, you can kill it like you did. I didn't kill the last one, okay? I had a stint that failed, you know. <laughs> um, huh? Yeah, yeah. What, I have, what do I have to experience to get to point, you know? Yeah. Yeah. He ends up his prayer by saying, you know, Lord, we cast ourselves upon you. We don't, not one of us can stand up in your presence over this situation. We cast ourselves upon you. And, and I, I think for our personal failures, this is it's a great outline of a prayer that when we fail, confess it, acknowledge God's goodness, own up to what you've done to, to the Lord, and, you know, really think about that question, what else does God have to do to me? And then just... Throw yourselves on his mercy. Ezra knew when he said that in verse 15, he recognized, you know, he had studied. He knew Achan, the one man, had stopped the progression of Israel into the land of Canaan until Achan's sin was dealt with. He knew Manasseh, that one king, is the man who sealed the judgment of Judah. 2 Kings chapter 23, verses 26 and 27. He sealed because of the greatness of his iniquity. He's the man who sealed the judgment of Judah. So, you know, he realized the seriousness of what was going on. And he humbly had cast himself as the positional leader cast himself before the Lord to say, you know, I, I can't stand in front of you. I'm not guilty of it myself, but I ain't got anything to brag about. I cast myself before you. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, you know, Ezra's response has a lot of good messages for us. It's not, you know, I got to act like Ezra. No, doesn't mean you got to act like Ezra. Go tearing your clothes off of you and everything. It'll get you put on the seventh floor in Catawba. But have a response that due to whatever position you have ensures that people understand. God has benefited, not, not me. I don't it don't make any difference about me. But that God has been offended by what's happening here. It can't go on. Whatever that might be. Whatever that situation is. Whether it's personally in your own life. Whether it's, you know, whatever it might be. We have to reach that place to where we say, this can't go on. I am not going to, as Paul said in Romans chapter 6, continue to allow our bodies to become the instruments of sin. I'm not going to do this. I belong to Jesus Christ. You know, that's, that's a decision that we make. And we cast ourselves upon the, the Lord, the Holy Spirit, to strengthen us in that warfare, Galatians 5, to overcome those carnal issues in our lives. Powerful, powerful passage of Scripture. Now, as we move into chapter 10, 
And once again, I, I really think chapter 9 and chapter 10 is why the book of Ezra is in Scripture. I mean, this is the signal thing that we remember about Ezra in Scripture. The signal event. Uh, all that he did, and I'm sure he did a lot of great things, but this is what the Holy Spirit wanted, included for us to look at and, and see an example for us. So as we move into chapter 10, Ezra's devotion to God and his leadership were pressured again. <laughs> we're brought face to face in, with a situation in chapter 10 of having to balance two commands of God that were seemingly contradictory. And in chapter 10, we have a, a situation that is descriptive of an action for a specific situation, not a prescriptive action for any situation. And that will become more uh, clear as we go into the chapter. And remember that Ezra wasn't just dealing with an individual issue. But the insertion of sin into the nation of the returned exiles. And Ezra actions, Ezra's actions were for a people out of whom the Messiah was coming. And so we, you know, we have to place Ezra's actions, all that he does, within the context of what was happening in that world. Now, in chapter 10, verse 1, while Ezra was praying and confessing, weeping, and throwing himself down before the house of God, a large crowd of Israelites, men, women, and children gathered around him. They too wept bitterly. Now, Ezra did all this when he first heard of it, but carried it on, continued in front of the house of God, probably in front of the burnt offering. It's probably an uh, altar. It's probably where this, where, where this was taking place. And he was, you know, pounding on himself. He was standing up, throwing himself down on the ground, quite demonstrative, you know. And Ezra, as the spiritual leader of the Jews, needed to project a godly seriousness that would cause the people to realize and acknowledge their failures. And there are times in which a leader must ensure that those under their care don't miss the seriousness of a situation. This is what he was doing. He wasn't just a comic acting here. He wasn't just putting on a show. This, this was serious to him. And he was wanting to, to, to reach the conscience of the leadership and of the people of the land and what reaches the conscience of that person or group you are over should be a part of our response to sin. However, those under our care should be able to see and know our distress at their spiritual situation. Uh, what reaches the conscience of the person? Say it's a family member. Let's do that. There are some family members that you can just break down and cry. And they will be all upset. And they, they'll want to talk to you. They want you to, you know, deal with the issue that they're going through that's brought about this, you know, response from you. And there are some family members that if they don't open the door, you might as well not stand there and bang on it. Because you ain't gonna, you're not going to make any progress. My family members are like that. If... if if they want to talk to you about a situation, they'll talk. But if they don't want to talk, you may as well leave them alone because you're not going to do any good. By standing there hammering on them, it'll be a deaf ear. It'll be like water on a duck's back. You ever seen people like that? Yeah. But what reaches the conscience of that person? What do you know? Sometimes it might take some very blatant talking. I had to do some of that this week. Um, wasn't rude, wasn't mean, but I had to be very plain. And 
And that's what was needed at that moment. And I, I didn't say a word until I was asked. When I was asked, then you ask me, I'm going to tell you, you know. Now, if you don't want to know, don't ask. But if you ask, I figure you want to know. And I will, I will be plain. Not me, not rude, but I'll be plain. Huh? Yeah, well, you know, sometimes you just have to be so plain that you just... <laughs> You look at it and click to see. Yeah. <laughs> I could be talking to a trans. I, you but never you know. Yeah. Whatever reaches the conscience of that person, you have, you have to know what you're stepping into. But if you know that person, what reaches that conscience? What gets a hold of them? But they need to see and know that an offense has happened to God. And as one of his children, you're upset at what has happened to him. Not so much what has happened to us. We'll, we'll continue to this. It's, chapter 10 is, is, is as good as chapter 9 in that sense. Thank you.